Welcome to lecture 2.7, quantifiers. To motivate this, suppose P is a proposition that depends on N, which comes from a universe U, then the truth set, which is a set of all values that make P true, that is a subset of the universe. In many cases, especially when P is an equation, we are often concerned with two special cases. The first one is, when is, is the truth set non-empty? In plain English, it says, when is P true for some values of n, at least one? And the next one is, when is the truth set the entire universe? In other words, when is P true for all values of n? The first of these two cases is what we call the existential quantifier, existential for exists. So if P of n is a proposition over the universe with non-empty truth set, in this case we say that there exists some value of n in the universe such that P of n. And if we don't say is true, it's understood that that belongs there. So often it just sounds better to say such that P of n is true, but we don't have to include the is true. And we write this as follows. So this backwards capital E symbol, you, uh, you can read it as there exists. So this says there exists an N, and then we put a subscript U to say that what universe we're in, such that P of N, or P of N is true. So this backwards E symbol it's called the existential quantifier, again, for there exists. And if the context is clear, we don't need this subscript U if it's understood. So often we will just write there exists an N such that P of N. Now, if the truth set is empty, in other words, if the statement there exists N such that P of N is actually false, then we can denote this by drawing a diagonal slash through the there exists symbol or the existential quantifier, which means there does not exist an n over u such that p of n is true. Let's do some examples. So this example, um, read this as, so here's that symbol again. There exists a k over the integers, over that boldface z, remember that's the integers, such that k squared minus k minus 12 equals 0. So this is why we often don't write is true. So, you know, if we have an equality here, we just say the equality. We don't say the equality is true. We can, but it's, it's just unnecessary. So th this statement here says that there is an integer solution to this equation. k squared minus k minus 12 equals 0. Second example, there exists a k over the integers such that 3k equals 102. This says that 102 is a multiple of 3. That is a true statement. Here's another example. The following statement, there exists a k over the integers such that 3k equals 100. That's a proposition because that is false. That is a false statement. Not a true proposition, but it still is a proposition. We can make it true by saying that there does make replacing the there exists symbol with the not exist symbol. So there does not exist a k over z such that 3k equals 100. That is true. Now, do you see another way to make this true? Well, here's one. Instead of over the integers, what have you said over the rational numbers or over the real numbers, then that would certainly be a true statement. So that, that's why sometimes specifying the universe is important. Although sometimes it, it just is clear from the context. Often if we use k or n to denote a number, it's, it's implied that those are integers. Not a, not a steadfast rule, but usually it's, it's at least understood to be that way. And finally, since the solution set to x squared plus 1 equals 0 is i and negative i, and here I mean i 
is the square root of negative 1, we can say that there does not exist an x over the real numbers such that x squared plus 1 equals 0, but there does exist an x over the complex numbers such that x squared plus 1 equals 0. Now here, and I didn't say it explicitly, but I am assuming, and you probably caught this, that when I said the solution set to this is i negative i, that I, at this point I had not said um, over the complex numbers, that universe, but I meant it. Because there are actually weird number systems out there for which there are more solutions to this than just i and negative i. In other words, like there are extensions to the complex numbers. And you don't need this for this class, but it's, it's worth seeing that one such example is what's called the Hamiltonians. So the, the complex numbers are the set of all a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers. And and the way to think about i here is that i is, is the square root of negative 1. However, the Hamiltonians, this is a, a capital H, that's just bold over, on the left side. That's how we write it. So this is a plus b i plus c j plus d k, where a, b, c, and d are real numbers. So think of this as like, adding two extra dimensions to the complex numbers, these are j and k. And you can think of j and k as being the square root of negative 1 as well. And I put this in quotes because it's, it's more accurate to think of, of j, simply, or to write j squared equals negative 1 and k squared equals negative 1. Because, you know, we're not used to thinking that like something like negative 1 can have a whole bunch of different square roots. So it's, it's more common to write this. And then we also have to write uh, that i times j equals k. Um, and, and that's it, the, these three extra laws. There's other things you can derive from this that I... Um, how about if I just tell them to you? So, so i times j equals k. It turns out that k times j equals i. Um, and the rule for multiplying these complex, or these imaginary co coefficients, uh, i, j, and k, are as follows. So if you write them out uh, like this, and you draw arrows between them, so if you travel in the clockwise fashion, um, then multiplying, so let me just show you, multiplying i times j equals k, j times k equals i, and k times i equals j. So how about if I write that out? So i, j equals k, j, k equals i, and k, i equals j. However, if you go backwards, so if you, if you do j times i, you get not k, but negative k. So j times i equals negative k. S similarly, i times k equals negative i times k equals negative j, and what's the last one? k times j equals negative i. So from this you can deduce that i, j, k equals negative 1. Um, it's a fun number system. You know, it's, it's not just purely for fun. Uh, this has a lot of neat algebraic properties, but this actually comes up in physics. H is short for the Hamiltonians, who was a, and he was a famous physicist, and this comes up when studying the the symmetries of three-dimensional space. Um, so this isn't just fun games, this actually has real-world uh, applications in our universe. Now, thank you for bearing with me if you stayed through that example. I know it was a couple minutes, but it, it does hit home the idea that, you know, even when we try to make sure that we specify everything, I'm saying over the real numbers or over the complex numbers, there are things that I'll say, like this sentence right here without even saying what a number system is, where I am implicitly implying that you are thinking that I'm over the complex numbers. You know, but of course, I could be over the Hamiltonians, in which case this is, I would actually have to modify this. In that case, I would say the solution set to x squared plus 1 plus 0 is i minus i, but 
also j minus j and k and minus k. Okay, enough of this. Let's, let's stop this detour and uh, move on. Next up is the universal quantifier. So now if p is a proposition, that depends on a variable n from a universe u, and the true set is the entire universe, then in plain English we say that for all values of n, p of n is true, if, if you want. Now we write this using this new little symbol, which is sort of like a capital V with a horizontal line halfway up, and this means for all. It's called the universal quantifier. So we write this as, or we read this as for all n subscript u, so over the universe u, p of n is true. So notice that I didn't actually say such that. So let's compare this to there exists an n over u. I, I had to say such that p of n is true, just because that's what we say in language. There exists an n such that p of n is true. I don't say for all n such that p of n. I say for all n, p of n is true. So don't, don't try to memorize that rule. Just, just think about how you would say it in English, and that's typically probably correct. So as I said above, uh, this symbol is called the universal quantifier. And if the context is clear, we can omit the subscript and simply write, for all n, p of n is true. Now, it's worth mentioning that unlike the uh, existential quantifier, where we can just put a line through uh, to mean there does not exist, we can't really, or we don't really do the same for uh, the universal quantifier. So this notation, the for all with the line through it, is not used. And just think about why that is. You know, what, what does... What would that mean? That would mean that that not for every n in u. Uh, maybe I should have not put the quotes there. T of p, or actually I should probably say p of n is true. So what does that mean? That could mean that p of n is always false, or it could mean that p of n is true for one n, or it could mean that p of n is true for all but one n. So there exists, could be either of these two, but this could also be, mean there does not exist. So it, it, it just means it's not true for all n. So it, it could be always false or it could be sometimes true. And so that, that's just too vague that we don't really use there does not. It's, it's not true for all n. We don't really use this symbol. Let's do some examples. So let's take a, a simple statement that we all know is true. Something like the square of every real number is non-negative. Now, even though we are not saying for all in that sentence, we can use a universal quantifier to write that. So we can say for all x over the real numbers, x squared is greater than or equal to 0. Next example. For all n over the integers, n plus 0 equals 0 plus n equals n. That is true. This is sometimes called the identity property of zero for addition over the integers. If you add zero to anything, you get back that anything. And now I said up here we can often omit the, the universe u, and typically when we write n, it's implied that it is an integer. So it's, it's not wrong to omit this. I think it should be clear what you say. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not clear if we want to specify this to be a positive or non-negative integer or all integers. So sometimes it, it helps to have this because it's not clear whether n is an integer or whether we want to just restrict it, oops, to be a natural number. So that sometimes we need to specify or clarify that. 
What I want to do now is show you several different equivalent notations for both universal and existential quantifiers. Um, so often just depends on the author. You know, different books and different people like to say things different ways, and especially in the information age where everything is Googleable and you can find anything you want online, there's typically not going to be one standard notation that you want to find online. Okay, so I'm going to show you several equivalent ways to write the same thing, and I will have both a universal and an existential version of it. Um, so there are actually two different things, but I want to show you how the different notations compare with these different types of quantifiers. Okay, so consider the statement, for all n in u, p of n is true. That's Now consider the, say, the companion statement with an existential quantifier. For, there exists an n in u such that p of n is true. Obviously, these mean very different things. I'm not saying they're the same, but this is the universal version. For all, this is the existential. There exists. Another way to write this is for all n in u, p of n is true. This is a symbol we've seen before. It means it is an element of this set. The existential version is there exists an n in u such that p of n is true. Notice that I inserted the such that in here, and I did not in here. Because again, I, I wouldn't say for all n in u such that p of n. No, for all n in u, p of n is true. However, if there exists an n in u, I don't want to say there exists an n p of n. No, there exists an n in u such that p of n is true. Third example, you don't need parentheses um, separating these. You could just use a comma. You can say, for all n in u, comma, p of n is true. Now, again, it doesn't really make sense to say there exists an n in u, comma, p of n. So we, we have to write there exists an n in u such that p of n is true. And sometimes we can use s dot t dot to stand for such that. So not a perfect match between these two, but I think you, you get the idea. Uh, next, the universal qu quantifier, uh, we can express as P of n is true for all n in u. And the existential version is P of n is true for some n in u. Now, you got to be careful because it's not quite right to say P of n is true there exists n in u. That, you know, that I, I've seen students write this, but this is not. This doesn't make sense in English. So please don't write it with a symbol. So, I, this is how, if you're trying to memorize this, it's a nightmare. You know, comma here, such that here, for all here, but no, not there exists here. For some here, do not memorize it. I have not memorized it. I just say what it, I first say it in English, and then I, you know, I I make sure that. What I write matches what I would say in English. And I'm, I'm better at speaking English than I am at symbolically manipulating mathematics. I think we all are, even those of us who are professional mathematicians. OK, finally, the last one is we can write explicitly P of n is true for all n in the universe. Or we can write the existential, existential version is that P of n is true for some n in the universe. So this, so this, this one really is, is a nice com companion here. Um, but again, if you, if you were to look at this you know, before this lecture, and, and I were to show you just, or you didn't know much about this, and symbolically, these do not look like these should mean the same thing. But if you read them out loud, um, convince yourself that they, that they do. And similarly, over here. OK, moving on we come to the topic of negating quantified propositions. Instead of starting with complicated symbolic logic, I'm going to start with an example that should motivate this. So over the universe of animals, define the following propositions. f of x is true if x is a fish, and w of x is true if x lives in water. So f for fish, w for water. Clearly, the proposition 
w of x implies f of x is not always true because there are animals that live in the water that are not fish. In other words, the following is false. For all x, remember, all animals, w of x implies f of x is false. Equivalently, there exists at least one animal that lives in the water and is not a fish. Now, symbolically, we can say that a statement above that is false, we can write that as the negation of this statement is true. Now, notice what I just did. I said, equivalently, there exists an animal that lives in the water that is not a fish, but I wrote it using a universal quantifier for all x. So really, what, what I wrote here is equivalent to this, and that is just there exists an x such that this implication is false, such that it is not true that living in the water implies one is a fish. So what I did is I brought this uh, negation inside and I switched this universal quantifier to an existential quantifier. And of course this last one, um, remember this implication is not w of x or oops sorry that's that's or f of x and so the negation of that by de morgan's laws is w of x and not f of x so that's what we have right here so here so symbolically this is a nightmare but make sure if you understand it in plain english it, it is intuitive so once we do a couple of these, even though symbolically it's a nightmare, I think you will get used to just um, looking at the symbols and bringing the negation inside and switching the universal to an existential. So one more time, there exists, or it is not true that for all animals, living in water means there are a fish, which means that there is at least one animal such that living in water, does, it's not true that living in water means there are a fish. So there's at least one animal that lives in the water and is not a fish. See, that's not so bad. The big idea here is that the negation of a universally quantified proposition is an existentially quantified proposition. In other words, anytime we have a statement like, it is not true that for all n, p of n is true, that is equivalent to saying there is at least one n, there exists an n such that p of n is false. And it turns out that the opposite of this is true as well. So you can reverse the, the roles of universal and existential and say that the negation of an existentially quantified proposition is a universally quantified proposition. And let's just make sure that this makes sense in plain English. So the um, if the following statement is false, if it is, it is not true that there exists an n such that p of n is true, and that is equivalent to saying that for all n, p of n is false. So that's, in some sense, the dual of this, this idea. Let me do an example of negating an existential quantifier, and then I'll go back to another universal quantifier. So the, the ancient Greeks, thousands of years ago, discovered that uh, the square root of 2 is irrational. Let's state this symbolically. There are two ways. You can say that it is not true that there exists a rational number such that that rational number squared is 2, so that statement is false. Or equivalently, for all rational numbers, r, r squared is not equal to 2. So again, notice that when I move the negation inside, this for exists this there exists turns into a for all, and this r squared equals 2 is false, which means r squared is not equal to 2. Okay, next example. The following equivalent propositions are either both true or both false, because they are, equi because they are logically equivalent. I won't tell you which one is the case right away. We'll see if we can figure it out. 
So the first one says, it is not true that there exists an n such that n squared plus n plus 41 is composite. And if that's the case, then that's equivalent to saying for all n, n squared plus n plus 41 is prime. So here it's, it's understood that n is a uh, natural number, just from the context. So if this is true, that means that all integers of the form n squared plus n plus 1 is 4, or n squared plus n plus 41 are prime. And it seems implausible, but if you, if you try things, you get n equals 0, you get 0 plus squared plus 0 plus 41 equals 41. That checks out. n equals 1, we get 1 squared plus 1 plus 41 is 43. Checks out. n equals 2, we get 2 squared plus 2 plus 41, that's 47. Checks out. n equals 3. 3 squared plus 3 plus 41 equals uh, 12 plus 4, that's 50, 53, checks out. Could this possibly be true? And if you try it, you get n equals 39, and you get 39 squared plus 39 plus 41. You get 1680, no, you get 1601. Is that prime? Well, Google will tell you that it is. And, and everything from... All of these in between here also check out. So this couldn't possibly be true, is it? Well, if you do uh, n equals 40, and you get 40 squared plus 40 plus 41, and you get 1681, and that is equal to 41 squared. Okay, so it does not true. It is it is does not hold. So this is not true that for all n this is prime, so this is false. And so that means that this whole thing is false. In other words, if you just ignore this uh, negation, this inside of here is true. So there is an n, at least one n, n equals 40, such that n squared plus n plus 41 is composite. Next up, you probably knew this was coming, multiple quantifiers. So we'll start with only using one type at a time. So propositions with multiple variables can be quantified multiple times. For example, consider the proposition. Uh, so p is, uh, depends on x and y. Uh, this says that x squared minus y squared equals x plus y times x minus y. This is a tautology over the real numbers because it, it is obviously true. I'll show you three different ways to write this with universal quantifiers. So first, for all pairs of real numbers x and y, so for all x and y over r cross r, p is true. Equivalently, you could say, for all real numbers x, it is true that for all real numbers y, p is true. So here I am, I am first picking any x that I want to, and then I can pick any y that I want to, and this is still true. And of course, I can pick y first. For all real numbers y, it is true that for all real numbers x, p of x and y is true. Now note that it doesn't really make sense to use multiple quantifiers if I only have one variable. So if I say p of x is true, if x plus x equals 2x, it doesn't really make sense to say, for, once you say for all x over the real numbers, you know, you're out of variables. You can't really say for all x again because, you know, you've, you've already picked an x. Now let's turn to the case of multiple existential quantifiers. So consider the following proposition over the real numbers, or I guess over r cross r if you want to think of them as ordered pairs, up to you. So q is a proposition that, that says that is true if x minus y equals 1, and if y equals x squared minus 1. 
So this is obviously not always true. And if you sketch what this looks like, um, so this, this first one here is, what is that, y equals x minus 1. So that's, that's this. And this one, uh, well, the next one is a parabola, x, x squared minus 1. So I think that looks like, like this. So maybe I should have used multiple colors. So that's, that's going to be have two solutions. So there will be two values. That's going to be 0, negative 1, and 1, 0 that make this true. So the solution set, um, or truth set, is a set of these two ordered pairs. Here are three ways to write this with existential quantifiers. There exists a pair of real numbers, x and y, so over r cross r, such that q of x and y is true. So this system, these equations are satisfied. Or you could say there exists an x over r such that there exists a y over r such that q of x and y is true. And finally, you can pick the y, y first. You can say there exists a y in r such that there exists an x in r such that q of x and y is true. In general, the rule of thumb is that quantifiers of the same type, in other words, both universal or both existential, can be arranged in any order without logically changing the meaning of the proposition. Of course, you know what's coming next. We will be mixing universal and existential quantifiers. But before we do that, let's see what happens when we negate statements like these, statements that have multiple quantifiers of the same type. We'll continue to do this by example to get intuition. So consider the following proposition, which of course is always false. So P depends on X and Y, and that's true if X plus Y equals 1 and if X plus Y equals 2. This is not going to be true because 1 is not equal to 2. We can express this by negating a proposition involving existential quantifiers. That is, it is not true that there exists a real number X such that there exists a real number Y that makes P true. Equivalently, we can switch the order of these. It is not true that we can pick a y uh, from real numbers such that we can then pick an x that makes p of x y true. It doesn't really matter what order we can pick these variables. We can either, there either is a solution or there's not. So an equivalent way to, to say this statement, now actually before we wrap our head around it. I've been saying, think about the English, think about it, how you would say it. But now, since, since it is complicated, let's remember the law that we, the rule that we've learned. You can take this negation and you can put it inside right there. And if you do that, this exists, swaps in, switches into a for all. So let's do that and let's make sure that this makes sense. So you know, there being no solution is the same as saying for all real numbers y, it is not it is false that there is some x that makes this true. Of course, that is the same as what we've had. So once again, we can take this negation and we can move it inside. And when we do that, that switches the existential quantifier to a universal quantifier like this. Let's do that and check to make sure that it checks out. So this is for all real numbers y. It is true that for all, uh, for all y um, and for all x, p is false. So no matter what we choose for y, no matter what we choose for x, p is false. And of course, we can switch the order back. We can pick x first if we want to and say for all real numbers x, well, for, then for all, so no matter what we pick for x, it's true that no matter what we pick for y, p is false. Okay, last slide. You knew this was coming. When existential and universal quantifiers are mixed, the order cannot be changed without possibly, I should say probably, logically changing the meaning. Now, typically you logically change the meaning. You could get lucky. You know, sometimes you don't, but usually you do. 
For example, consider the following two propositions, and I claim are different. So P, which depends on two positive numbers, A and B, I omitted the of A and B, I think it's clear from the context, is true if for all positive numbers A, there exists a positive number B, such that A times B is 1. I'll let you convince yourself whether this is true or false. And now, read Q. Q is true if there exists a real number B, such that for all, sorry, all positive number B, such that for all positive numbers A, A times B is 1. Okay, you figured it out. You know which one is true and which one is false. Congratulations if you got it right. P is true, but Q is false. So you can check that P is true because for all positive numbers A, just, just let B be equal to 1 over A, and then you get that A times B equals 1. So here you to verify this, you came up with a formula for a B. To disprove this, so it says there exists a B, such that for all A, A times B equals 1, um, you can convince yourself just from common mathematical knowledge that, yeah, of course, this is absurd. There's no real number such that B, such that you multiply by anything and you get 1. But you say, of course, because you are used to real numbers, and this is something that you just know inherently. You know, what if I were asking you a complicated proposition that uh, had nothing to do with real numbers or some uncomplicated or some co complicated system of other numbers or axioms that you're not familiar with. It might not be so obvious. You can't just look at this and say, of course, it's not true. You need a systematic way to do it. And one way to do that, to see why a Q is false, is to verify that not Q is true. So it's sometimes one of these will be easier. It might be either easier to verify that Q is false directly or that not Q is true. So in this case, I think it's slightly easier to verify that not Q is true, but it's about the same. Um, so let, let, let's check this. So to verify that not Q is true, let's write down the negation of Q. And remember that the negation of the statement, we can bring the uh, negation sign inside, but we have to turn this existential quantifier into a universal quantifier. And we get that this is equivalent to, for all B, it is not true that for all A, A times B equals 1. So once again, you know, wrap your head around that, that's maybe a little tricky, but we can take this and move it inside and flip this for all into a, a there exists. If we do that, we get that this is equivalent to for all positive b, there exists an a such that a times b is not equal to 1. And that is obviously true, right? For all positive numbers b, we can certainly find an a such that their product is not equal to 1. So that is arguably a little bit easier to wrap your head around than, than to disprove this one. And, and here... I think it's probably harder to, to do this here. It, it seems to be easier, at least in my experience, to, to bring the negative sign in as much as you can. Because when you say that a big long statement is false, it's just easier to, to make that as direct as possible, to say that the, this inner statement is false, and then add quantifiers out here. So this is optional, but I think it's a neat little trick to keep in your bag uh, with you as, as you do these problems on the homework and study for the exams. I want to conclude by reminding you that sometimes we get lucky and changing the order of quantifiers does not change the logical meaning, or at least whether the, the prepositions are true or false. But this is rare. Of course, you can come up with simple examples. You can say, you know, for all, say, real numbers A, it is true that there exists a B real number such that 1 you know, that is always going to be true, trivially. And, you know, you could say, well, yeah, so there exists a B such that for all A, 1 is true. That's also true. 
But sometimes it's more subtle. Sometimes you actually s switch the order of these things and you, from dumb luck, get, some, get two things that are both true all, all of the time. So here, um, I'm basically going to change the ex above example by changing a 1 to a 0. And I'm also going to change the universe from the positive real numbers to the, the real numbers because I need to include 0 as a possible value for A or B. And, you know, I could have done this above over the real numbers, and it still would have been true. Okay, so P says, for all real numbers A, there exists a real number B such that A times B equals 0. This is, of course, true. Just, just take B to be 0. Now, Q says, there exists a real number B such that no matter what you multiply by A, for all A, A times B equals 0. Similarly, just take B equals 0. And the same thing works. So here you got lucky, but you can't necessarily guarantee that that's always going to happen. In fact, it's usually not going to happen. You got to be careful when you switch existential and universal quantifiers.